Hello everyone, today we are in England to look at a case that took place in the 1850s. So sit back as we go to 19th century London. Frederick Manning was born in 1819 in Taunton, which is in the southwest of England, about 165 miles from a nation's capital, London. When Fred finished school, he found work as a railway worker, and after a few years, he was promoted to the job of a guard, and he was stationed in London. His father died in 1845, leaving his property to Fred's mother. Maria was born in Lucerne in Switzerland in 1821. Her parents died when she was a teenager. Maria lived a poor life, so decided to move to England to work as a domestic servant. Her first employer was Lady Anne Pulk, the wife of the MP, Sir Lawrence Pulk. Lady Anne was extremely wealthy and had a very large and beautiful house with fine furniture and all the things that went with being part of the mid 19th century aristocracy. Maria developed a taste for the trappings of luxury and came to dread the thought of returning to her impoverished way of life she had in Switzerland. In 1846, she moved to London and worked in service at the house of Lady Blantyre, who was the daughter of the Duchess of Sutherland. The house was called Stafford House and was in the west end of the city. This was one of the great stately homes of the capital and Queen Victoria was a frequent visitor. Maria was a witness to some of the richest people in the British Empire living their luxurious lives. Because she was a French speaker, Lady Blantyre asked her to accompany her on a trip to France. And while on the boat between Dover and Boulogne, she met Patrick O'Connor, an Irishman from County Tipperary. He was 20 years her senior, but they seemed to get on well. Patrick worked as a custom house officer in the London docks and also did his own smuggling, which although was a serious crime, produced a very lucrative income. The two of them started going out on Maria's days off. Shortly afterwards, Maria met Fred while she was traveling on the Great Western Railway. Fred was only two years older than Maria and Maria thought herself very fortunate that both Fred and Patrick were interested in her. After all, she was just a poor young lady from Switzerland. She was convinced that both men would propose to her, so wanted to work out which one was the richer and would provide her with the best lifestyle. Patrick seemed to live a good life as he spent freely, but he drank a lot and she had no desire to marry a man who was always in the pub. Fred was a guard on a train, so he had a steady but low income. But he told Maria that he expected to inherit a fortune from his mother. The problem with Maria's dilemma was that Patrick had not proposed to her. So when Fred did in early 1847, she thought of the large inheritance, and this was enough for her to accept the proposal. And the couple were married in the May of the same year. Shortly after the wedding, Patrick wrote to Maria, telling her that he loved her and that he was about to propose just before she married Fred. Shortly after the wedding, Fred left his job on the railway and took a tenancy at a pub called the White Hart back in his hometown of Taunton. Fred was not a good businessman and due to a combination of drinking his profits, mixing with petty criminals and constantly trying to impress the town's young ladies. It meant that they soon had to leave the pub and make their way back to London. The pub's failure also led to issues with the couple's relationship. They took a house in the Bermondsey area of the city where Maria found work as a dressmaker. To increase their income, they took in lodgers. Fred continued with his drinking and Maria started to see Patrick again. Patrick's investments and smuggling had done well and he was now considered to be a wealthy man. 
Maria was very upset that she had married the wrong man and decided that she needed and deserved some of Patrick's money. On July the 23rd, 1849, a delivery of lime arrived at Maria's house and on the 8th of August, a large shovel was delivered. Maria then asked Patrick to come to her house for dinner that evening. He arrived, but he brought with him a male friend named Walshy. Maria told him that she was a bit frustrated, but he didn't come alone, so asked him to return the next day. Patrick, still very much in love with Maria, agreed. The following evening, Patrick was seen by friends crossing London Bridge, and the Manning's neighbours noticed an Irishman smoking a cigar by the back door of their house. Before dinner, Maria told him to wash his hands, and he went into the kitchen. Patrick then turned towards the basin, and Maria placed a pistol behind his ear and shot him. The bullet, however, did not kill him. It cracked his skull and travelled under his skin and came to rest just above his eyebrows. Fred then hurried into the kitchen and finished the job by hitting Patrick several times in the head. The couple then lifted the paving stones in the kitchen and using the shovel and the lime concealed the body beneath them. So Patrick was buried in the kitchen of their house. The next morning, Maria turned up at Patrick's lodgings in Greenwood Street. His landlady, knowing who she was, let her into his room and she found several hundred pounds in cash, gold watches, chains and foreign bonds. The next day, on another pretext, she returned to his room and had another search for some more bonds that she thought would be there, but she didn't find anything. On Friday the 10th of August, Patrick's work colleagues were very concerned that he had not turned up for work at the London docks. This was unusual, as he was never absent from work. The following day, when he wasn't there again, one of his work colleagues went to Patrick's lodgings to investigate. Patrick was not there, so he spoke to the two other tenants in the house, who told him that on Thursday they had met Patrick and he had told them that he was going to dinner with Maria. When he then asked the landlady, she told him that Maria Manning had visited the lodgings on Thursday and Friday nights, but she hadn't seen Patrick on either occasion. The colleague, now very concerned, went to the police. The police went to the Manning's house and spoke to Maria. She told them that Patrick hadn't come to dinner on the Thursday and that she had called to his lodgings that evening and on Friday to see if he was okay. But she was unable to locate him. The police searched Patrick's apartment and found that securities and cash were missing. The visit from the police panicked Maria and she decided to leave London. Maria told her husband to go and try and sell their furniture. As soon as he left, Maria collected together everything of value that she could carry and left. Neighbours saw her leaving in a cab. When Fred returned, he found his wife gone and realised that he was on his own. He took what he could and went to Waterloo Station, where he caught the boat train to the Channel Islands. The police were starting to think that Patrick's disappearance was very suspicious and this was confirmed when they were informed that Maria Manning was seen leaving the house with luggage and had not returned. They went back to the Manning's house and conducted a detailed search of the premises. One of the officers noticed the fresh cement around some of the flagstones in the kitchen and on lifting them they discovered a man's body his wrists bound behind him and his legs doubled up. Quicklime had been poured over the body in an attempt to prevent any identification. But later, dental checks on the set of false teeth found in the remains confirmed that the victim was indeed Patrick O'Connor. The police now launched a murder investigation 
and started to look for Fred and Maria. In answer to an appeal from Scotland Yard, a man came forward and told the police that he had taken Maria to the South Eastern Railway. There, using the name Mrs Smith, she had left two suitcases. He had then driven her to Kings Cross train station. At Kings Cross station, the police superintendent Haynes spoke to railway officials who remembered a woman who spoke English and French and seemed to be very nervous. She had travelled on the 6.15am train to Edinburgh. The police telegraphed their colleagues in Edinburgh requesting that they traced and arrest Maria. Maria, however, was already in custody. She had tried to sell some of Patrick's railway stock and had told the company that her father was a Mr Robinson, a native Scot. The company was suspicious as some railway stock had already been reported as stolen and they had contacted the police. Maria was returned to London where she was charged with murder and sent to Horsemonger Lane Jail. Frederick had another week of freedom before he was caught. Staying in St Helier, he drew attention to himself by drinking heavily every day. But when he met a man who had known him in London, Frederick fled to St Lawrence. The man he had seen in the Channel Islands read about the case on his return to London and lost no time on informing the police. He was arrested, having evaded arrest for nine days longer than his wife. Maria remained silent when she was arrested, but Fred immediately blamed his wife. He asked if she had been arrested and was delighted to hear that she had been. He told police that he was entirely innocent. This was foolish, given that it would have been impossible for her to lift the flagstones in the kitchen by herself, but Fred didn't realise that. The investigators were happy enough to let him try and blame his wife and knew that by putting the two of them against each other in court they would almost certainly ensure the convictions of both of them. The papers dedicated pages to the story. Naturally Maria was the main headline. She was attractive, foreign and had served in noble households. It was almost if she had been tailor-made for the press sensationalists and female murderers in the 19th century always sold more papers. In British law at the time, a wife could not be charged as an accessory to murder committed by her husband, as it was presumed that her first loyalty was to him. The trial would need to show that she had pre-knowledge of the planned crime, or that she directly took part in it, or that she had acted on her own initiative in making an attempt to profit from the murder. Proving that became the focus of the investigation. The trial opened at London's Old Bailey. On the 25th of October, Maria's barrister argued that as a foreigner, she was entitled to be tried by a jury made up of half British citizens and half foreign nationals. Fred would have to be tried by an all British jury. And so the barrister asked for separate trials. This was denied on the grounds that Maria's marriage made her a British citizen. At the trial, bloodstains on a dress belonging to Maria and the proof that she had paid for the shovel and the lime were crucial evidence. Fred's lawyer put up a very strong defence, but the evidence of the body under his kitchen floor was overwhelming. Maria's lawyer told the court that Maria could not have been present at the murder but she had robbed his room and fled. So despite his best efforts, the prosecution's case was very solid. When the jury was sent out to consider the verdict, it only took them 45 minutes to find both Fred and Maria guilty. Before passing sentence, it was traditional to ask for prisoners if they had anything to say. Fred did not say anything, but Maria said, that there was no justice and no right for foreign nationals in Britain. She shouted that she was innocent. The judge passed the sentence of death by hanging to both Fred and Maria. 
Maria refused to give up her fight for freedom. She had once been a servant in the household of Lady Blantyre, whose mother, the Duchess of Sutherland, had been a very close friend of Queen Victoria. So she sent a letter to Her Majesty, appealing for mercy. She did not receive a reply. On Tuesday morning, the 13th of November, 1849, Fred and Maria met in the prison chapel. As they stood before the altar, Fred turned to his wife and expressed his wish that they should not part in animosity. Maria replied that she had none, and then she kissed him. Maria asked for her black silk handkerchief to be tied around her eyes beneath the black veil so that she would not have to see the gallows she would soon be approaching or the very large crowd that had gathered to see the execution. The noise of the crowd was really loud and while they jostled for position, one woman died in the crush and two men were severely injured. It was before this baying crowd that Fred and Maria were led out and hanged together. They were buried on prison grounds the same day 